psychoactive substances, medical remedies, love potions and spells. We're going to see that the Egyptians were no strangers to getting drunk and high, and the first pornographic lifestyle probably originated in Egypt. The wonderful image before you is from the 18th dynasty tomb of Nebemun, depicting a banquet scene with partially naked dancing girls and elaborately dressed musicians. Sophia, could uh, we just ask you to turn your microphone up a little bit because you are a little bit quiet apparently. Uh, just one second. Right. Um, I think I can't do it. <laughs> one second. I think it's up already actually to the max. I do apologize. Um, can I just stop sharing for a second and see if I can fix it? Yes, sure. Uh, just bear with me one second. Um, just one second. I am quite softly spoken anyway. I can hear you fine. Is everyone still having a problem with hearing Sophia? Because she's quite loud at my end. Uh, it's all right better. now. Yep, is that better? That's better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, is that good? Yep, is I feel. <laughs> right, so should I start again or should I go on to the next page? Is that okay? So I'm going to begin by looking at alcohol, which in Egypt consisted of beer and wine. This will be followed by a look at the medical papyri. And finally, we're going to look at psychoactive substances, sex culture, and festivals. So the Egyptians, they, by the way, beer was called Henkid, so we're going to start with beer. The Egyptians consumed vast quantities of beer as it was part of the daily diet. In fact, the pyramid builders were paid a daily amount of beer and bread. A sex, excessive amounts of beer were consumed during some festivals, such as a festival of drunkenness, which was associated with divinity. Beer was also used in a huge number of remedies. Some words, model bakery and brewery from the tomb of Meketra from the Middle Kingdom. Um, it's now housed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but I find its discovery interesting because it was discovered in a hidden chamber at the side of a passage leading into the rock tomb of the royal chief steward Mecca Ra. And he served a number of kings, I believe four kings, including Mentuhotep II. Now the tomb itself was plundered during antiquity but in the 1920s, accurate floor plans of the tomb were taken. And during this time, they found 24 almost perfectly preserved models um, in this chamber. So half went to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo and the other half went to the Met. So beer was obviously much valued in ancient Egypt. And this can be seen in countless tombs in which the offering formula commences with a request Babila Montuosa's daughter holds a water lily. She's over here. And his father offers a covered dish of food and of course, a jug of beer. The stealer was pretend, presented to him by King Sen Wazret in appreciation of his loyal services. Again, this is um, now in the Met. So what ingredients um, was Egyptian beer composed of? I don't know if um, any of you have looked into this, but I was really curious. So we know they used emmer wheat and barley, which was coarsely crushed or ground, and then heated in water together with grains that had been malted in their husks. Possible additions to the beer were pomegranates, figs and dates. And of course, these would have provided nutrients for the beer. Now I want to tell you about an interesting study which was published last year by Farag El Masri Baba Friedman. They basically used gas chromatography to have a look at which compounds were present in ancient Egyptian beer. So 
excavated at a site in High Acropolis. This site is really, really old. It dates to about 3764 BCE. So you can see it's really old. It's actually the oldest brewery ever found in Egypt and it's the earliest large scale brewing site in the world. So they found a staggering 70, they found a staggering 45, sorry, 45 compounds belonging to 11 chemical classes of metabolites um, in, in the residue. Metabolites are just um, substances that are necessary for metabolism. So what's um, fascinating is, well, fascinating for me, <laughs> is that um, phosphoric acid was found. So the reason why phosphoric acid is interesting is because these days it's a common additive to alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks to prolong the shelf life and enhance the flavor of a beverage, which is most likely the reason that it was present in this residue. This, of course, would have allowed the Egyptians to mass produce beer and, you know, it wouldn't have gone off and it would have lasted for a reasonable length of time. So I feel this is incredibly remarkable for this period of time. This is before the pyramids, by the way, so it's really old. Um, so another amazing discovery was um, in 2014, where they found the tomb of a brewer named Konsu Imheb. Um, this was by a Japanese archaeology team. But this was not just any brewer. He was the head of granaries and beer brewing for the worship of the Egyptian goddess Mut, who we're going to be looking at when I look at the festival of drunkenness. The scene here shows um, Konsu Imheb and his wife receiving an offering from his son. Um, so I thought this was quite fascinating. But um, what I was really interested in is um, whether the beer was tasty. So I started trying to find um, what I could. And then I stumbled across um, the British Museum website with this blog. And here, food historian Tash Marks invited a couple of brewers to help recreate a 3,000 year old Egyptian beer. So, for this challenge, they used traditional methods and ingredients to get as close as they could to the, the beer that they drank. So, they used a ceramic vessel, as this was essential for the um, fermenting process because its porous interior is the ideal service for the wild yeast culture to grow. It's also cooler to the touch than the ambient temperature, which would have been an obvious advantage if you're brewing in a hot, arid climate. Anyhow, to cut a long story short, they found that the beer was actually really tasty. As thick as they expected, which probably they did sometimes, but it wasn't actually that thick. They also found that the alcohol content was stronger than we imagined. So it was about five to 6%. Right, just before I um, look at some of the remedies and health benefits of beer, I just want to go through the 12 main medical papyri that we get a lot of information from. So this is a bit of a crash course. So the first is, here, the Edwin Smith Papyrus. So it was purchased in 1862. It's the oldest known surgical treatise. It contains accurate prognostic comments on traumatic and certain inflammatory diseases. Um, what I find interesting about this papyrus is that it consists of cases and not recipes like the other medical papyri. So it begins with injuries of the head and it works its way downwards. And each case is classified into three verdicts. So you have favorable, unfavorable, um, uncertain. The unfavorable verdict comes around 14 times. So unfavorable obviously would have meant that they can't treat it, but they didn't abandon the patient. They still tried to make their life comfortable. So the 48 um, cases unfortunately break off when we reach the thorax which is a shame, um, but, that, but that is all we have. 
So um, out of these 14, I found interesting, 14 are head injuries, seven are cervical, and one is of the lower spine. So each case begins with a surgeon's examination followed by diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. So for wounds, um, they would have used bandages and adhesive plaster strips. More serious wounds are stitched. There's mention of a gaping wound in the throat, which would definitely have been stitched. Wooden splints were used and casts are used for supporting fractured limbs. Now, what I found really interesting is that these are very similar to modern surgical casts. They, and I broke my arm um, last year, actually, and I actually had an Egyptian surgeon who put my arm back in place. And um, I didn't have any painkillers or anything, so I feel like I experienced what the ancient Egyptians would have experienced. Um, they also used a fire drill because they cauterized. They would drain the pus out of abscesses. What's also interesting is that they would use um, fresh meat was always applied on the injury on the first day. And this would have been to reduce swelling. It was bound and followed by an application of lint saturated with honey and oil. Poultices were used for some injuries. And what's really fascinating is that the physician actually checked the pulse. And this is about 1,500 years before the Greeks did, so before Hippocrates. So the heart and its relation to the entire body through the pulse appears to have been understood. So then I just thought I'd give a few interesting facts about the Adrian Smith. Um, the word for the brain occurs at least eight times. Case six is a very severe head injury with um, a laceration and it records some interesting characteristics of the brain. Um, it also, there's also 27 cases of um, head trauma. Uh, sorry, I mentioned that, sorry. There's 11 skull fractures. Now, what I found interesting is that in mummification, we always say the brain was removed because the Egyptians didn't understand the function of the brain. But in this papyrus, there's obvious knowledge of the meningeal membrane surrounding the brain. There's knowledge of brain convolutions, the spinal fluid, the frontal sinus, the nasal cavities, and the anterior fontanelle pulsation, which you can see in babies. Case 25 I find really interesting because it offers treatment for a mandibular dislocation and the procedure is similar to what is performed now I and mean, it's almost identical. So it hasn't changed for thousands of years. So sorry to go on about that one so much, but I, I do love that one. Whoops, sorry, let me go back. What it's actually trying to do is point to the Ebers, which I'm going to talk about next. So the Ebers papyrus was purchased in Luxor by Edwin Smith in 1862. It's said to be found between the legs of a mummy and possibly came from the tomb of a doctor. Um, the same possibly as the Edwin Smith, but to be honest, we don't know for sure. It's now in Germany. Um, the papyrus dates to the early New Kingdom, so 1550-ish BC. It comprises 110 pages and is by far the longest of the medical papyri. It contains around 900 medical prescriptions and diagnoses, which are written in a slightly haphazard manner. Some of the remedies do include spells, so it's, it's different from the Edwin Smith where we don't really see magic. It's divided into sections, um, so it includes the book of the stomach, there's reference to migraine, regulation of the flow of urine, remedies for a cough, diseases of the eyes, the skin, treatment for bites, for example, we've got bites of crocodiles, even human bites. There's unspecified diseases of the liver, injuries including burns, beatings, fresh wounds, diseases of the extremities, of the head, the tongue, so I'm trying to go through it fast, so otherwise I'll be here all day. Um, diseases of women, ulcers, tumors, and swellings. So the knife treatment is recommended in 10 cases, and this provides our main source of information on surgery other than trauma. 
There are parallels to other medical papyries, such as the Hearst, Berlin, and London, which I've listed here. The verse of the papyri has no medical content, but it does provide means of dating the papyrus to the reign of Kham and Hotep I. The drugs or ingredients and the remedies are of mineral, animal, vegetable origin. So minerals include, for instance, clay, copper, granite, gypsum, lapis lazuli. Um, we've also got um, Nalmud, Natron. Herbal remedies include acacia. Um, acacia would have helped with wound healing. Coriander, which we know is rich in immune boosting antioxidants. Date, hemp, juniper, linseed, moringa, onion. Um, willow I found interesting because it contains a compound which is similar to aspirin. Wormwood, which helps from digestive problems to increasing sexual desire. And then of animal origin, there's fats and oils, honey, milk, blood, placenta, bile, meat, internal organs, and even excrement of various animals and urine. So honey was the most widely used ingredient. Um, and it's, it comes up in hundreds of remedies. Um, honey would have been effective because um, it has antibacterial, antifungal properties, which are mainly due to the osmotic effect of high concentrations of sugar. So bacteria, of course, doesn't grow in honey. And honey has been demonstrated to accelerate wound healing. It's been effective in healing burns and ulcers. Um, placenta of a cat was, um, in case everybody's wondering, that was used to prevent hair from turning gray. And crocodile bile was recommended for the treatment of a human bite. So animal fats were used extensively in prescriptions, partly due to their ability to make a greasy ointment, and partly in the hope of transferring some desirable characteristics of the animal. There's an interesting remedy for someone who's losing their hair in which um, fat of various animals were recommended. So we have fat of a hippo, a lion, a cat, a crocodile, a snake, an ibex. Um, this, I reckon, would have been quite an expensive remedy. Um, the Ebers papyrus doesn't mention the brain, but it does mention the heart, and there's a vessel book there. Um, they believed that the heart was at the center of blood supply with vessels attached to every part of the body. So the heart was perceived to be the meeting point at which um, vessels carried all fluids of the body, such as blood, urine, semen, and tears. So the anatomical heart was called the hati, and then they had another word, um, which was ib, and this was more related to emotions. So then we've got, um, just a point, so we've got the Cahun, which actually is the oldest medical papyrus ever found. It's, it's the oldest one we've got, and this is mainly concerned with women's problems. And the Hurst, which is generally medical. Chest BT6 is interesting because it's almost entirely concerned with diseases of the anus. So some prescriptions were to be taken by the mouth, some for local application to the anus, and some were poured into the anus as an enema. Now, some physicians were actually called the herdsman or shepherd of the anus, which is a very fancy name for a proctologist. <laughs> um, I thought, I found that really interesting when I first um, read that. I thought, now that's what you call a title. <laughs> and then um, we've got Berlin, which is mainly medical. Some of these I'm going to go through quickly because um, they sort of repeat the same prescriptions. So um, Carlsberg 8 is mainly gynecological. Then the Ramesseum, which again, women's problems, eyes and pediatric. London and Leiden, then we've got the Vienna papyrus. Now, the Brooklyn snake papyrus, I'm just going to talk a little bit about because it's in French and I spent a lot of time translating it and it's really interesting. So the papyrus was a manual for medical, medical practitioners known as circuit priests. They would have been called upon to deal with snake bite victims. 
So the first part of the papyrus identifies 21 snake varieties, including the spitted cobra, the black desert cobra, Persian horned viper, puff adder, and of course the Egyptian cobra, which is implicated in Cleopatra's death. The second part of the papyrus lists a number of remedies to treat snake bites. So the papyrus does contain elements of magic and it provides various incantations. So the remedies include liquids such as wine, beer, which we're going to be coming to soon, milk and oil, which were used um, as a medium in which substances could be mixed or dissolved. Some re recipes, and I find this really interesting, even included the temperature at which the treatment should be administered. So some of the ingredients in this papyrus include sycamore, moringa, jujube, common plants include spelt, castor, mallow, but the most important ingredient actually happened to be the onion. Now the application of an onion, even now is used to, is, is supplied to stings and it can draw out poison. But honestly, if you're bitten by a snake, please call an ambulance, don't try this. Um, some of the animal, pro animal products used in the remedies included burnt hooves, dried donkey droppings and gall from russet colored goats. So they were so specific. One paragraph mentions blood from a young goat, which was then rested and returned alive to his mother, which I think is quite sweet. Um, they, I've, they also mention cat's blood in um, some of the remedies. And I wondered if this was because of the Heliopolis myth in which a cat slaughters a serpent demon ape. They also mention the use of cobra blood in wound dressings. Um, so for example, there's one remedy which has blood of a cat, fish, crocodile, and the cobra, and it's used as a compress now it's interesting that cobra blood is used since it's toxic but it also contains antitoxins which are anti-venin substances so these actually it would have been healing so it made me wonder if the egyptians knew the healing benefit products which we are only just was really interesting and even snake um, venom actually is being used for medicine as well. Right, um, so going to move on to pres so prescriptions. So we don't really have much information on how the physician healers obtain the raw material. And unfortunately, there's still so many ingredients that we're unsure of, but with beer and wine, we can be quite confident. So the active, um, Active ingredients can be extracted from herbal preparations in water, alcohol, and oils. So the active drug in a herbal preparation would have been an alkaloid, such as atropine and morphine. Um, alkaloids are best extracted from alcohol. So obviously beer and wine would have been excellent. So there are five main routes of administration of drugs. So these are oral, rectal, vaginal, fumigation, and external application. So the ancient Egyptians actually measured in volume rather than weight. Um, alkaloids, by the way, um, just in case um, any of you are not sure, it's a natural occurring organic compound which contains at least one nitrogen atom. So alkaloids include, for instance, cocaine, nicotine, caffeine, morphine, atropine, and can act as anesthetics such as morphine and codeine. So, beer was used extensively in medical remedies and was often used as a vehicle to take other prescriptions. So, some of which would have tasted awful, hence the beer would have disguised the taste or perhaps perhaps even help to forget the taste, particularly when you're dealing with excrement. The Ebers papyrus contains around 106 prescriptions um, in which beer is one of the ingredients. Sweet beer appears 68 times, 
which um, I thought was really interesting. So do you remember the study that I just mentioned in which they found 75 compounds? Well, one of the compounds that they found was proline. And pro proline actually happens to be very high in dates. So this is how we know that they use dates to sweeten the beer. But of course, they would have used honey and other things too. So beer, of course, would have had a slight sedative effect and it may have contributed to the placebo effect as well in remedies. The fermentation process would have produced ethanol, which is toxic to bacteria and fungi, making it useful in medicine rather than drinking contaminated water from the Nile. The beer, of course, was also very nutritious because um, it contains soluble fire, fiber, sorry, not fire, protein, carbohydrates, and vitamins. Um, Epis 293, for example, is a remedy to cause the stomach to receive food. And this remedy is a broth of sweet beer, vegetables, fat, and figs. Now, the ancient Nubians, they actually brewed beer that contained the antibiotic tetracycline, and I thought this was really fascinating. This antibiotic treats bacterial infection through the skin, intestines, respiratory tract, urinary tract, and genitals. The Egyptians did have different named beers, but we don't actually know if this is one of them. And I did try and look for proof um, of this beer. And what I found was that tetracycline beer was consumed in the Dukla oasis, um, but this was around 480. Now the tetracycline probably got into the beer from con contaminated grain stores of millet and sorghum, which the Nubians actually used to make the beer. So we're getting slowly, gradually onto the strongest stuff. So onto wine. So in ancient Egypt, the royal family and the upper classes are the ones who drank the wine. Everybody else drank beer. So viticulture and winemaking scenes were represented on tombs from the Old Kingdom onwards. The wine jars um, actually included the year of the harvest, the ownership, quality and even the name of the winemaker so it's not that different from what we do now so wine offering to gods were performed by the pharaoh this is often shown on war temples depicting festivals such as the hepset which i'm sure everybody's heard of it's sort of the continued rule of the pharaoh um, also in new year's celebrations of flooding of the nile religious festivals banquets and generally parting scenes Wine was also offered to the dead in the afterlife. And um, we see this in the funerary, uh, in the pyramid text. So the wine jar in the slide is from the tomb of Senegem from the 19th dynasty, TT1 in Thebes. It's now in the Met and is decorated with floral garlands like those that are used in representations of funerary feasts. Several jars were found in his tomb actually. Um, when Maspero excavated in, I think it was 1885. So it was thought that Egyptians produced red wine, but we now know that white wine was also produced. Um, a study in 2005, which was conducted by the University of Barcelona, they actually found remnants of white wine jars um, from uh, Tutankhamun's tomb. They used liquid chromatography to study the contents. And actually, um, if anybody's interested in wine in ancient Egypt, they've actually created an excellent database um, with wine depictions in lots of different scenes. And I love interactive maps, and they've actually ma made an interactive map as well of all the tombs in which there's depictions of wine. If you want to have a look, the website is just called wineofancientegypt.com. So really easy to remember. And this picture is there because I just, I just happen to love it. <laughs> it's from, it's Never Moon's Garden and it's full of birds, fish, fruit trees, such as sycamore figs, date palms, etc. Um, 
they make a date wine as well or a, a palm wine of some sort yeah well they they would have used those um in the ingredients so yeah definitely so um so wine appears quite frequently in the medical papyri where it's often used as a liquid vehicle to swallow medicine the this i found really interesting because i wondered how strong the wine would have been um, especially when you look at the scenes of everybody getting really drunk and actually what i found was that the alcoholic strength is 10 to 20 percent which is pretty strong it's i mean definitely strong for me and um, and i think you know it had to be strong to extract the alkaloids as well so I think the one that I already mentioned, Evers 287, this requires wheat growth to spend the night before being drunk. And this actually could have been a method for extracting alkaloids from plants, such as a blue water lily, which I'm going to be looking at shortly. Of course, wine also would have been a pleasant welcome flavor to some of the remedies. And the mild intoxication would have also offered some reprieve from an illness. And in this slide, you can see I went through all the um, remedies I could find in Evers, and I've listed them here. So there's quite a few with wine, as you can see. Right, so like I said, we're gradually going on to the stronger stuff. <laughs> so now moving on to opium, which was known as Shepen. It has the Latin name Papava somniferum. Now, Opium's caused so much debate in Egyptology, and it's still an ongoing debate. So opium, a resinous residue from dried sap is obtained by incising the ripening capsule of the opium poppy and collecting the extruded sap as it dries. The resin has a very poor composition, depending upon many environmental factors, but generally it contains a number of physiologically active alkaloids including the analgesics, morphine, and codeine. Opium poppies, of course, are a man-made cultivar and not a natural plant. So here, so scenes in Egyptian tombs and temples show gardens and plants. The poppy is frequently depicted in New Kingdom art. It's here at the bottom here. So this is a scene from the tomb of Senegem at Deir el Medina in Thebes. Um, opium could have arrived in Egypt during the New Kingdom period from Cyprus. The shape of the Bilbil jugglers is very reminiscent of an upturned poppy. So that's there here. Might some of um, this opium influence have come from Manoa as well, because they had the poppy goddess in Manoa and a lot of poppy representations there. It could have, definitely. I mean, it definitely came from another country because um, we, we see it mainly from the New Kingdom period. Um, although it is in a lot of remedies right from the beginning, so we're not sure. We're not is it possible that um, Tutmosis the Third mm. puppies? Exactly. He was interested. Yeah, in point. he did. He did actually. Yes. So, um, so in the in the nineteen nineties, some pottery was actually tested, and it came up negative, unfortunately. But then um, in 2018, researchers at the British Museum and University of York, they found opium alkaloids inside one of these vessels. So this was the first time that dependable chemical evidence was produced to link the opium to these containers. Now I was asked this question that um, opium is harvested as a resin that could far more easily be exported as a lump. So why go to so much trouble putting it in these parts as a liquid to export it? So my friend, Rosalind Park, she's an excellent scholar and expert on Egyptian medicine. So she provides this explanation, which I think is really good. So I'm just going to read it. So she says the base ring juglet in the report is dated from 
the second intermediate period to the reign of Akhenaten, when trading seafarers were not only spreaders of pestilence, but sensibly ought to have carried instant morphine remedies for any that needed it on the boat and throughout the land from Ugarit, which is northern Syria down into Egypt. So that does make sense. Moving on. So psychoactive substances in opium were most likely discovered by experimentation. It's a medicinal plant that was known and cultivated by ancient civilizations, as I've said. The, just to reiterate, the liquid or dried sap, known as latex, um, is obtained by lancing the outer surface of the poppy pods. And these days, of course, is used in the production of heroin. The search into opium alkaloid chemistry actually didn't begin until the 1800s. Evidence of opium use as a recreational drug during pharaonic time. Honestly, I've really tried to find it, but it's virtually non-existent. However, it was used in medicine, which we're going to look at. Lack of evidence, of course, doesn't mean that the Egyptians didn't know about it. And obviously, um, they, they would have learned from the, from the neighboring civilizations. It's just we're yet to find concrete evidence that it was used before the Greco-Roman period. It was definitely used from the Greco-Roman period as a recreational drug. But um, in the tomb of Karl at Deir el Medina, which dates to around 1500 BC, the parva was discovered in a vase. But unfortunately, the tests for alkaloids came back inconclusive. There is, of course, um, evidence of opium use at the time of the Greek physician Herophilus, who spent some time in Alexandria. This was to help with um, uh, the relief of pain. Andreas, for example, who is thought to be a student of Herophilus, contrib contributed to pharmacology by looking at the toxic effects of certain plants and animals, including the deleterious effects of opium. Galen, who was born around 129 AD, he lived in Alexandria for a number of years. And of course, he mentions the addiction of um, Marcus Aurelius, which I'm sure quite a few would have heard of this. Um, right, so. Opium was known um, as a Shepan plant in ancient Egypt, and it's mentioned in prescriptions in the Pepper's Papyrus and the Edwin Smith. So I'm going to have a quick look at these. So here we have a few remedies in which opium is mentioned, but its internal use is only mentioned once. And this is in Pepper 782, which is here. Uh, for a colic child. So um, basically, he recommends poppy and flies excrement on the wall. So you mash it and you eat it for four days. And opium, in fact, is an effective remedy for stopping children crying. And it was used in England in the 19th century as well, specifically for this purpose. So the ancient Egyptians were definitely right. Um, Ebers 440, 443, and 445, which are here, sorry, they're not in order for some reason. These are all hair treatments. Ebers 443, I find interesting because um, the scorched hippopotamus skin with the oil could contain the natural oil that is produced by the hippo. I don't know if um, anybody's watched um, the Curiosity documentary documentaries um, in which David Attenborough looks at the hippo and he talks about the hippo producing this slime which resembles blood. Um, this slime was actually tested by scientists and what they found was um, that is antibacterial and a natural sunscreen. And when I was um, researching this, I found that hippo oil comes up in a lot of remedies for the skin. So I did wonder, um, I mean, I'm quite convinced that this is the oil that they were using um, for skincare because it would have uh, 
um, he would have tweeted, uh, he would have possibly to act as a natural sunscreen. Sorry, and I'm mumbling on a bit about this one. Um, and here we have remedies which run in the Edwin Smith. So case 41 is for a patient with a chest wound that is infected but not impacting the bone. The remedy here includes red poppy, um, carrot beans and pulverized sycamore leaves. Um, red poppy would have been used as an anti-inflammatory analgesic. Case 46 appears to be an epidermal cyst and um, the poppy with other ingredients would have been used to desiccate the open cyst. Okay, cannabis, I'm going to go through this one really quickly. The reason being that there's no clear evidence that the ancient Egyptians understood the narcotic effects of cannabis. But um, there is evidence that they used hemp for rope. Um, cannabis, however, it is included in prescriptions. So it was administered by mouth, rectum, vagina, bandaged to the skin, and applied to the eyes by fumigation. Right, now we're going to move on to um, products where I know that they probably did understand the narcotic effects where we've got a little bit more evidence. So there were two water lilies that grew in the Nile. So one was a blue water lily with the Latin name Nymphaea cerealia, and the other was the white lotus, known as Nymphaea lotus. These plants differ from each other in several ways. So the blue water lily, to your right, which is often misleadingly called the blue lotus. It's not actually a lotus. It has um, pointed flowers and um, floating leaves with smooth edges, while the white lotus has rounded petals and leaves with toothed edges. The blue lotus is by far the one that is most widely depicted in imagery. So far, only one word, Shashen, has been identified for these plants. So the blue water lily is thought to be widely used for its pleasant fragrance and because it was regarded as a symbol of the sun since the flowers open around 9 a.m. in the morning and they actually close at 3 p.m., so not that late. Because I think, you know, there's um, some modern day water lilies which have been tweaked a little bit to close a bit later. And in fact, it contains um, four narcotic alkaloids, which are concentrated in the flower and rhizome, but is absent from the seeds, stem and leaf. They're soluble in alcohol, but not in water. And therefore to experience the um, narcotic effects, the flower or root would need to be ingested so there is an Egyptology scholar called um, W. Benson Hurry in 1985. He suggested that placing the water lily flowers in wine would produce a narcotic laced wine. So the two main alkaloids that are attributed to the blue water lily are apomorphine and nuciferine. So apomorphine has been used since the 1800s to treat insomnia, depression, schizophrenia, and in veterinary medicine, it's used to induce vomiting. So at Heliopolis, the origin of the world was thought to have been when the sun god Ra emerged from a blue water lily growing in primordial waters. So at night, he was thought to retreat into the flower again. So to the left of Tutankhamun is the god Nefertem, um, who happened to be the son of Sekhmet, who we're going to be looking at in a minute, and the god of the water lily, of course. So, and on the right, thank you so much for Curtis for this incredible image, is Tutankhamun, represented as Nefertem. You are more than welcome, Sophie. <laughs> Thank you. So when um, Tutankhamun's common tomb was discovered, it contained a plethora of botanical specimens, 
for which Carter called upon the expertise of Percy Newbury. He happened to be a professor of Egyptology at the University of Liverpool and probably the first British Egyptologist to publish on plants. So the floral tributes um, were examined by Percy Newbury. They were so well preserved and easily identifiable. So amongst other specimens, he discovered blue water lilies, and these were quite abundant. The most spectacular floral tribute discovered was around the golden face of Tutankhamun. And I know Curtis loves the golden face of Tutankhamun. It's, it's incredibly beautiful. The collar was made up of blue water lilies, along with other plants such as date palm, willow leaves, pomegranate, cornflowers, and olives. And by the way, the picture of Tutankhamun and Uncas Norman on the back of the famous throne, which I know everybody has seen, shows the king and queen, and they're both actually wearing collars like this. So in many of the scenes portraying partying, banquets, and festivals, is the blue water lily, or mandrake, that's depicted. So it's being conceptualized that its purpose was either for fragrance or to represent rebirth. And these are excellent suppositions. Um, but I want to propose that in these particular scenarios, the presence is more to do with getting high and achieving an altered state for various reasons. So in this slide, we can see a banquet scene from fragments of a wall painting from the tomb of Nebu Moon. Um, so guests are dressed up in stunning garments, they're being served food and wine, and everywhere you look, there's blue water lilies and mandrakes. So Mandrake this, or mandagora? Yeah, mandagora, exactly. That's the correct scientific name. Well done, I'm impressed. <laughs> well, that's just Harry Potter knowledge. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk about Harry Potter in a second, actually. So in this slide, we can see musicians and almost naked dancing girls. So next to the dancing girls here um, is a large, um, the large wine jars. I mean, some huge rack, as you can see. Um, and many of the guests actually are wearing garlands of flowers and they can be seen smelling the blue water lily. So perhaps here smelling the blue water lily could be more symbolic of the psychoactive effects of the plant. So obviously the blue water lily would have had to be soaked in alcohol to release the mind altering effects. But I do think that sometimes we have to realize that these representations um, could be a little bit more metaphorical. And right, so we're going to have a look at the medicinal uses um, of Nymphaea cerulea. So apomorphine, an alkaloid present in the blue water lily, it was actually recommended by the FDA as a treatment for erectile dysfunction. This I found very interesting because the blue water lily appears in the Turin erotic papyrus. It also is known to have hallucinogenic properties. Again, it's used in the erotic papyrus, which we're gonna have a look at now, is really interesting. So before I do the next slide, I just want to warn everybody, it's a little bit graphic. Okay, <laughs> so, this papyrus um, was discovered in Deir al Medina workers' village and it measures around eight and a half um, feet by 10 inches. It's dated to the Ramesside period. It's probably the oldest depiction of sex, and as you can see, it's um, full on pornographic. It's obviously unrealistic because it's swamped in fantasy, as is porn today, of course, so not much has changed there. To me, there appears to be a single protagonist who um, appears to be an aging, balding man, perhaps having a midlife crisis, carrying out his fantasies with younger females. 
Right, it has been suggested that this scene is actually a brothel. We don't know. It could be. Plenty of alcohol has been brought for the occasion, as have blue water lilies. Um, and there's some other unidentified plants, which could be the bindweed, which is here, because I was speaking to Rosalind Park, and she thinks this is actually bindweed. And I think, you know, I think she probably is right. Um, bindweed, of course, would have been used to induce vomiting, which maybe if you've taken a bit of an overdose, which would be useful. Um, this papyrus is the only one that's discovered, but there had to be others, perhaps tailored to the owner's particular desire and fantasy. Uh, by the way, it was discovered in the 1800s, but it wasn't revealed until the 1970s, which um, also incidentally happens to be the decade of the hippies and drug culture. And I think in Egypt, um, the 18th dynasty was like the hippie stage. This is what I think, um, and possibly the 19th dynasty as well. So what's interesting to me about this virus is that there's an obvious absence of deities and religious themes. So here the argument of the water lily only representing rebirth in a religious context falls flat. Its representation as a pleasant scent also, in my opinion here, is inapplicable since the subjects are not sniffing the flowers. Notice that the water lily is above the head of each female subject. So if you can have a look here. So is this a representation of the narcotic effect of um, nymphaeus cerealia affecting the mind? The water lily here could also represent ancient Egyptian Viagra to aid the protagonist in his erotic fantasies. And it could be a symbol of sexuality. It's only recently been discovered that apomorphine can be utilized with excellent results to treat erectile dysfunction. So I think the ancient Egyptians um, already knew about this. And a good study to read is Bertel, uh, 2004, in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine. Um, I, I think this is quite an excellent study on this topic. Um, anyone who's interested in the science of apomorphine is basically a centrally acting selective dopamine agonist and activator of dopamine receptors in the brain, because dopamine is produced in the brain. Um, the specific region is a paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. This basically initiates a cascade of events, ultimately resulting in smooth muscle relaxation and dilation of blood vessels, eventually leading to penile erection. Um, some of the, um, I don't think you can see in here, but there are a few words in this papyrus as well. Um, some are quite graphic, so, but one which is less graphic is, um, come behind me with your love, O oh son, you have found my heart, it is agreeable work. So now we're going to move, to, oh, oh yeah. I just happened to get these today and I just want to thank Alberto Ravel. I don't know whether he's there, but he allowed me to use it. So this is what the papyrus actually looks like. And they just sort of put it together and got the images, but I thought it would be nice to see what it actually looks like. Now we're going to. It might actually be entirely innocent. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Just filled in the blanks. Do you think <laughs> the blue water lily use relates at all to the head cones? Because they seem to relate to parties and festivities. I wonder if perhaps that could have been absorbed through the skin somehow. The thing with water lily it has to be dissolved in alcohol for the narcotic effect to be released. But I do, I absolutely love those head cones. Mm -hmm. I was so excited when they discovered those head cones, actually. But it seems to be mainly composed of wax. Yeah. But then there's also some people that think perhaps the, the cones they discovered in those graves, because there were workers' graves, were like cheap copies of the fancy, expensive, rich person's 
head cones potentially. So maybe they had different ingredients. Possibly. But I would have thought that wax, um, they would have been using beeswax, which couldn't have been that cheap. So mm. it's hard to say. It's, it's very difficult to say. Um, it, you know, I think they would need a stronger test to see if they can scoop out any residue. Any, um, I'm not sure what test they used, but I don't know how deep they went to checking the chemical composition. But I do know that um, the main ingredient that they discovered was wax. Yeah. But it will be interesting to find out what happens in the future. But at least we know that they were real mm. and they did use them. So, um, right, this, this actually in this side is, I love this image. It's one of my favorites. I think it's so beautiful. Mandra isn't mandrake something that was used in um, like witches' potions, flying yeah. ointments, and things like that. So, that's something that could have been absorbed through the skin. Maybe mandrake and the blue water lily were used together. They, uh, yes, they were. And, and this, this is um, so basically, um, the mandrake has a it's, it's you're right, and the do you know why they thought it was to do with witches because you know, the root, mm. the root looks quite scary so um for harry potter fan, harry potter fan <laughs> harry potter fan here so it does pop up in a scene in the chamber of secrets in which professor sprout instructs the class to put on these um these earmuffs and the reason is is to protect their hearing because there's a myth that mandrakes would scream when they poured from their roots so you would either end up um, with delirium or you would die. So they, would, they wore these masks to block out the sound. Um, with the mandrake, um, Hipp Hippocrates actually, he remarked that a small amount of the mandrake would relieve anxiety, but he did caution against the effects of an overdose, which would produce delirium. Aristotle, I mean, everybody's had a go at uh, mandrake. He placed mandrake above the, um, among the substances that induce sleep. Now, although yes, it's related to witches, etc., but you know, the Egyptians, they, um, they didn't seem to consider it dangerous at all. So this image here, it's um, of a New Kingdom banquet scene, and um, it shows a female guest, she's offering another yellow mandrake fruit. So the fruit itself did have a very pleasing scent while the plant, it contained um, hyacinth, which is an alkaloid, with the ability to cause hallucinations, delirium, and in large doses, coma. So, it, so I think, you know, knowing exactly how much to take is very, very important. Um, it has been thought to have an aphrodisiac effect. It, it is very toxic though. So if you have a look at this picture, each headband that the women are wearing features a, a lily. No, the flower is not open. So again, it's obviously not for the scent. Now the fruit of the mandrake is rounded with a pointed end. It's fleshy and it contains seeds. And although it looks edible, it's not actually edible. And I've been told that it tastes pretty awful as well. So why does it appear so abundantly, um, particularly in the 18th dynasty um, tombs? Well, I think it's because the meaning of the mandrake um, in the context of Egyptian love poetry um, is sort of a metaphor which evokes female breasts, love, eroticism. So um, as Curtis mentioned, it was most, uh, most likely imported to Egypt during um, the reign of King Tutmosis III. And this is because um, it can be witnessed in the Botanical Garden Sanctuary at Karnak. And I was trying to find an image um, of that garden, but I couldn't find one, unfortunately. So I would have loved to have shown you that. So now we're gonna have a look at Mandrake the Science. So seven alkaloids, have been identified in the, in the mandrake, um, correct name being mandragora. Um, and it's found in the roots. Th um, 
Three of these can be used in medicine as a narcotic and anesthetic. So in high concentration of these alkaloids can cause intoxication. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking if it tastes bad, the reason for its use must have been narcotic. Um, but unfortunately, the medical papyri are pretty silent on, on its use in, in that sort of format. Now, um, so many Egyptologists, I feel they're quite hesitant or argue that the Egyptians didn't know about the narcotic effects of the mandrake, but uh, I'm not so sure I agree with this. It is mentioned in um, the Gematic Magical Virus of London, where the root is listed as an ingredient for preparing a potion that serves to cause the man to sleep for two days. And of course, we know that the root contains hyacinth. Um, the shape of the root, um, as we were saying, and its alkaloid, alkaloid content, it did become, uh, came to be associated with witchcraft and magic in later times. Actually, I don't know whether you know this, Sarah, but some people didn't like to pull the root out themselves. Sometimes they would get their pet dog to pull it out of the root. Um, because they were scared of the effect, so I thought that was quite interesting as well. Um, so, now, the, the narcotic effect of the root, I feel, certainly has to be taken into this from banquet scenes, um, such as this from the Tomb of Nacht, which, um, Women, they're passing around the mandrake fruits, they're inhaling his scent. Some of the females here are seated in on the top. Sorry, my mouse is kind of funny, but on the top left hand corner, um, you can see some of the women, they're sitting on these lovely mats. And what are they holding in their hands? They're holding um, the water lily. And while they're passing around the mandrakes, so, although yes, um, the mandrake does evoke erotic images, but if you have a look at this scene, I think it's more to do with the narcotic effect. So now we're going to have a look at the festival of drunkenness. And I wrote a little bit about this. So in 2004, the John Hopkinson column, which so the exciting thing was that the column drum was inscribed with the words, "She made it as a monument for her mother Mood, mistress of Ishuru." making for her a columned porch as so this now dr betsy bryan i don't know if anybody's watched her lectures but she she does an excellent lecture on this she was director of the mission she believes that the inscription pinpoints Mood Temple as the location of the festival called the Heptech. This event, in a state of getting wasted, reenacted humanity's salvation in the story of the myth. So, for those who have some values, human plot against sun god in his wrath he, he decides to punish mankind by sending forth an aspect of his daughter the eye of Ra. Um, let your eye go that it might smite them for you the schemers of evil may descend as Hathor. so the nurturing goddess of the good things in life such as love
I think we've lost Sophia. Uh, yes, you're right. And it, it had a lot of echo before that. I hope it's okay now. Yeah, let me just see if I can get her back. I think um, uh, Sophia's gone out and will come back again, hopefully. Let's get that back. Just talk amongst yourselves. Well, I think her uh, talk is quite interesting and fascinating. Um, and I'm learning so much. I had a quick question, maybe one of you will be able to answer. Do we know any of the names of the doctors? Is there something like this is a, a Dr. So-and-so who is suggesting this remedy or? I'm not sure anybody? actually. I'm sure there probably is evidence of um, names on some of the papyri. We can ask we her that. A name, we have a name of a dentist. Yeah. <laughs> Hesira. But I can't remember his name right now. His name is Hesi Ra. Hesi Ra. And yes. he has uh, several wooden uh, panels, doors that are at the Egyptian Museum. Yes. I believe there's 11 of them, but only three are on uh, display. Um, I'm very ignorant about uh, medicine in ancient Egypt, but she had such a vast uh, selection of papy papyri, and I thought maybe in one of them there would be a mention. Um, but one is enough for me, and a dentist is fine too. <laughs> so I have the sound here, if anyone would like to hear what a mandrake sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> you would love to. Okay, okay Sophia a... says she's lost internet, she's just trying to reconnect. We can have a little break while she's trying to get back on. I'll quickly play the sound of the mandrake. Okay, great. Thank God you're here. 